We are starting Jonah this morning. We are, um, we kind of just simply call it Jonah, a whale of a tail. And Jonah has a real fish story to tell us and a real fish involved in his life and in his story. Kind of like my new favorite TV show. Anybody want to guess what it is? I love River Monsters. Anybody seen that show? River Monsters? All right, for those of you who have not seen the show River Monsters, there's this guy, Jeremy Wade, okay? And he is like a marine biologist or some, something like that. And he travels the world trying to kind of catch these huge fish, all right? But, but the catch is they're all out of like freshwater fish, all right? So you thought like only the oceans were dangerous. That's where the sharks and the stingrays and everything is. Like, no. So he's only in fresh water. He's only in the river. So they call it river monsters. And he pulls some, some crazy huge fish out of these rivers. And you got to remember, I'm the guy that hates sharks. All right? So I'm already not swimming in the oceans. All right? And now I'm watching this show, and, and he's pulling these things out of, like, rivers and lakes. And I'm like, I'm never going. I'm the guy that screams when the seaweed brushes past my leg. Like, that's me. I'm in Lake Michigan going, ah, shark, you know? There's no sharks in Lake Michigan. That's me, though. All right, so my kids are, are restricted to pools. That's it. You are in the pool after I've seen some of these, these stories that he is doing. All right? So, so anyway, so he, he goes all over the world, Congo, um, you name it, Mississippi, all these different rivers, and catches these huge, I mean huge fish. Like, I wouldn't, you wouldn't even believe how big some of these things are. Some of them are nasty looking, too, like just vicious looking. All right? So I'm sitting there one night, and I'm watching this show, totally mesmerized. I probably wasted way too much time on the television. But I got to thinking, I was like, you know what? Like, I would love to be that guy. Think about the stories he has to tell. Think about when he's older and he's got his kids or his grandkids on his knee. And he's got all of these awesome fish stories to tell. Think, forget, think about it now. Like he goes to the barbecue. He goes home. He go, wherever he goes, he's got all of these crazy, crazy fish stories that are true to tell people. He's like the guy. You, you know the guy, right? Everybody has a guy in their life that has the stories who's like the life of the party, who's always got the story, right? I kind of blogged about that, so you can go to the website and read a little, a little bit about that. But like, you know the guy who's always got the story. And then, I, and then I thought, you know what? Jonah's that guy too. He's got the story. He's the guy that's telling all of his buddies once he gets back to Israel, hey, listen to what happened to me. Okay, so he got it from doing bad things, but he still has the story, right? Like, he still has the story. It's still all good. And then I, then I kind of clicked for me. I got nothing. I got no cool fish stories. Zero. Absolutely zero cool fish stories, right? So I'm like... Oh, I, I, I'm a little jealous at this point because I'm like, my kids are going to like, and my grandkids are going to jump up on my knee in like 20, 30, 40 years. And my story is going to be like, once upon a sermon, and then, and then they're going to like all check their baby monitors and hope I wrap it up before nap time. So it's like, that's just how it's going to be for me. So then I got like really jealous. And I was like, I really want to be the guy with the story. I really want to have a tale to tell. My kids, I want to be the guy at the barbecue that's like, ah, oh, th this happened, and then this happened, and then that happened. But I don't want to be that guy for me. I want to kind of, I want to be that guy who tells a story about what God is doing and what God is doing in my life and in our church and in our community. And I'm studying Jonah, and I realize, you know, Jonah has a fish in the story, but it's really not about the fish. Jonah is about a guy that struggles with following the Lord. I struggle following the Lord. It's about a guy that's sometimes hot and sometimes cold when it comes to his relationship with God. I'm sometimes hot and sometimes cold in my relationship with God. It's about a guy that makes some really good decisions and some really, really, really poor decisions. I find myself doing the same thing, struggling with my decisions. He's a guy that struggles through ideas and emotions and what it looks like and how he's supposed to go about following this God, following this guy that, that is leading him that he calls Jehovah God, and how he lives in the amazement and the awesomeness and the wonder of God. I want people to be wide-eyed, and I hope you do too, and I think you do too, and I'm 
banking that you do too. You want people to be wide-eyed and amazed at the glory and the awesomeness of God. You want people to sit back with that amazing look on their face as like kids in a candy store and just look at you as you tell the story about what God is doing in your life and how God is writing your life story and how it's becoming such an amazing tale and such an, a God, God-given, God-ordained, God-glorifying whale of a tale. I want to live a life like that. I want to be the guy with a story about God and what he's doing in my life. And in order to be that guy, in order for us to be those people, we need the book of Jonah. Because Jonah wrote his story down. And there are truths and there are principles and there are things that Jonah does that we want to do. And there are things that Jonah does that there is no way we want to do those things. And so we need his book, we need his story, we need his tale. If we're going to live our own whale of a tale, if we're going to live our lives as a story that God is writing, that is a story worth telling. That is focused on God. All right? Jonah chapter 1. That's where we're at this morning. Jonah chapter 1. But before we get there, our kids are in here from Clubhouse and 4th and 5th grade. So I need a kid volunteer. I need a kid volunteer who, who, who thinks that they can Construct the story of Jonah on this flannel graph. All right? So I helped you out a little bit. I got, I started it for you and I ended it for you. All right? And we're going to read Jonah chapter 1. And I need somebody who thinks, and I got like pieces down here, who thinks that as I read, you have total creative license to do whatever you want. You can, you can put the story together on the flannel graph. Now, if you're 30 or over, you know what that is. If you're 30 or younger, you want to know where it plugs in at, all right? So that's fine. I get that. It's a flannel graph. Those things stick. I need somebody who can construct a story as I read it, and I'm blinded by lights. So I'm going to go... Uh, I can't see any... I mean, I can't really... Can I just have one of the, uh, Matthew West, can you come up? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I had West and Neil, and so I put them together and I got, <laughs> that's how I got that. All right, sorry. That works out wonderfully. All right, hurry up. Come on, run, run, run. I need you, I need you, I need you. All right, so he, if you want to pay attention to the final graph, that's cool, I get it. All right. So that's why he's up here. All right, so see, I got like your pieces, both, and, and then they're kind of hard to stick, so you're going to have to kind of push it. But don't push too hard, it'll all go over. All right, I'm sure you'll figure it out. You're a very smart kid. All right, ready? Jonah chapter 1. I'm going to read it, and you are going to put it together. All right, here we go. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. All right, we got that part. It's kind of got like the thought bubble, Nineveh. Okay, good. All right, but Jonah ran away from the Lord. I'm telling you, I should write a book called The Butts of the Bible, and this one would be in it. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish, the opposite direction. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. There you go. Put up the boat. You do whatever you got to do. You just just keep up. I, I can't... Oh, yeah, good job. All right, good. Can't push too hard or it'll all go over. Okay, but Jonah... Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. And all the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. All right, so now the storm, there you go. See, you got it. You're smart. All right, here we go. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. And the captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And this terrified them, and they said, What have you done? And just 
I'm going to give you a little break, okay? Thank you. Okay. All right. You're doing, you're doing great, though. All right. Uh, Jonah's so nice. Jonah writes this story. And can you think, picture all these, like, rough sailors, right? And they're like, Jonah, what did you do? Jonah, what did you do, Jonah? No, they're like, Jonah, you're dumb. See, in this time, in this period of time, people worshipped all these different gods. So these sailors had a sun god, a moon god, an earth god, a land god, a camel god, a donkey god, a horse god. Like they had all these different gods that they worshipped, right? And so, so here, here Jonah's like, my god is the god of the land and the sea. And the sailors are like, are you serious? You, you worship the sea god and you chose to get on a boat to run from the sea god. Jonah, what did you do? Jonah takes... Jonah takes all the sailor language out of the text, okay? Because it wasn't, Jonah, what did you do? All right, I'm just letting you know that, all right? This terrified them, and they said, uh, this terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running from the Lord because he had already told them. The sea got rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should, where should, or what should we do to you to make the sea calm down? All right, since you're not doing anything, Jonah, well, what should we do about it? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. And they cried out to the Lord, Please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. And they took Jonah, threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. And now the Lord sent a great provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Excellent. Good job. Right there. Good job. You did it. Give him a hand. All right. Jonah runs. He's asleep. Storm. Toss it all overboard. And it ends with a whale. Here, here, here's the thing I, I, wa I want us to do this morning. This is a flannel graph. We all saw this in Sunday school. Any one of you could have come up here and put this story together, and I probably wouldn't have even had to read it. You would have known what it says. All right? we, we have a category, even if it's an unspoken category for this, it's called Noah and the Ark, David and Goliath, Daniel in the lion's den, Jonah and the whale. All right? We got it. We know it. We all learned it. We don't need it. As adults, we have the idea that it's a Sunday school flannel graph story. For the next three, four weeks, I want to invite you to come with me past the flannel graph. Come beyond the flannel graph, and let's go into the book of Jonah as adults. What is there that will help us live a life that is worth telling, a life that is God-honoring, and a life that is glorifying? What is there that will help each one of us live our own whale of a tale? All right, what are the biblical principles? What are the truths that we can learn? All right, can we do that? Can we go there? I think we should start where the book starts. Chapter 1, verse 1. The Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. All right? Any, show of hands. Anybody have any doubt what Jonah is supposed to do? Anybody? There's doubts in your mind. I'm not really sure what Jonah's supposed to do right now. Nobody. Everybody knows. So it's clear to you, right? It's pretty clear what Jonah is supposed to be doing. All right? It's pretty clear to Jonah what Jonah is supposed to be doing because he's running. He's doing the exact opposite of what he's supposed to be doing. So it's pretty clear to him. All right. Any of you, like me, sometimes you catch yourself saying, as I do, I wish God would just speak to me and tell me what to do. I wish, God, this would be so much easier if after this sermon I went home and the bush in my house was on fire. <laughs> right? Sometimes I feel like that, though. You feel like that. You're like, this would be awesome if I could just follow a pillar of, by day and a pillar of fire by night, and it would all work out. I would know exactly where to go, exactly what to do. There's no questions, right? I wish I was Balaam and his donkey talked to me. Like, if my dog talked, I'm in. There's no doubt about it, right? I find myself doing that. But listen, listen, here's the fun part. Abraham, not Abraham, what am I talking about? Moses, Moses had a burning bush, and you know what his reaction was? I'm not going back with that. They're going to laugh at me. 
Can you see Moses? Hey, guys, uh, Burning Bush told me I'm the leader, so get out of the way. <laughs> uh, what? You know? Like, the guys that were in those situations where God showed up and talked to them, their record isn't any better than my or your record. Jonah's like, God speaks to me, gotta go. Like, that's what it was. It was incredible. It's an amazing. God's got to be so frustrated by, with us, by the way. Moses is like, God, could you just write it down? Here's the Ten Commandments. We're like, God, could you just show up in a fiery bush? Like, he's like, I don't know what they want anymore. Like, how do they want me to talk? I don't know. Right? Like, I don't know. I can just see God being so frustrated with us sometimes. But, in, but anyway, so, so, so God speaks directly to Moses, and he, and he runs away. Listen, this is God's word. God's word, the word of the Lord came to you. You all have one. God wrote it down for you. So you don't have to go to, you know, Ian doesn't have to come to me and say, God told me I'm the leader. Right? Because we know what leadership looks like. God's word, it's clear. It's here on marriage, on relationship, on finances, on parenting, on kids, what you're supposed to do, adults, what you're supposed to do, how to run a church, how do you counsel, how do you love the ungodly, how do you love your neighbor? It's all right here. It written, God wrote it for us. God wrote it for us. He wrote it down. If we're going to live lives that are worth telling about, that are our own tales, we have to realize that everything that God has for us, everything that God desires for us, everything that he absolutely without a doubt wants us to do in life is right here in his word. Another way to say that is this. God's word is God's will for God's people. God's word is God's will for God's people. Right? And instead of being like Jonah, where the word of the Lord, God's word, came to Jonah, God's people, God's man, and told him exactly what to do, God's will for Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach against it. God's word, God's will for God's people. Instead of running away from God's word, we got to run towards it. we got to run towards God's word instead of running away from it. If we're going to live a whale of a tale, we have to realize that this is it. This is the answer for life. God's word. When it comes to anything you're struggling with, addictions and, and just marriage, and it doesn't even have to be struggling with. If you just want answers, run here first. Go to Oprah later, way later, okay? Like, this is it. God's word is God's will for God's people, and we need to run towards it. All right, number two. From verses 3 to 11, and I'm not going to read all those. I'll, get them, I'll catch them up, catch up to them later. But just simply, just write this down. Um, sin infects the whole ship. Sin infects the whole ship. Look, Jonah's the only one um, that, that, that's recorded anyway that has sinned in, this, in chapter 1. All right? Jonah's the only one that, that it's, it's recorded as direct disobedience to God, direct sin towards God. And he kind of creeps onto this ship. See, only Jonah knows verse 1 and verse 2. Like, we have the whole story, but in the narrative, in the story, sailors don't know what Jonah just did. Sailors don't know what God told Jonah to do. They don't know any of that, right? So, so in the story, Jonah's the only one that knows that he, he's disobeyed or that he's sinned. And so he creeps onto this ship, and it ends up affecting Everybody and everything on the ship. The stuff goes overboard. The, the guys are crazy. They're praying like mad. Jonah's doing nothing but sleeping. Like it doesn't just affect Jonah's life. It affects everything around Jonah. Nature even. There's got to be a storm. It affects the poor whale who had to swallow Jonah. All right? It affects everything. Sin infects the whole ship. But we don't... Here's what happens in our life sometimes. Here's what happens to us. All right? Oh, go slow. Okay, can you all see this? Good. I think I can. Oh. Here's what happens in our life. We, we start to think, um, here's what we do, okay? Let me get some of this stuff out of here. We're kind of like Jonah sometimes. We, we have these compartments for things. Right? Like Jonah, I can see Jonah on this ship, and he's like, you know what? 
this is just my little issue with God, and I'm just going to get on this ship, and I'm just going to run the other way, and it's not going to be a big deal to anybody else, because I just got this own little deal going on in my own little heart, and it, it's totally cool. No one else is going to be affected by it. And sometimes we fall into those same traps, and we got like, here, here's my own, little, my own little deal at work and my own little deal at home, my own little deal as a mom or a dad, and, my own, and this is church, so this, one, this, this compartment, this container, this area of my life is a church area, and this is, you know, and on and on, and like we kind of got our lives sectioned out into these, these little containers or these, little, these, these things with walls, like we try to put walls up around different areas of our life, right? And they come out looking like hard <laughs> plastic containers. I call it the Titanic effect. If you know the ship Titanic, the hull of the ship was, was divided up into sections so that if there's a hole punched in one section, it can close it off so that it doesn't spread to the rest of the section. Sometimes we think about our life that way. Sometimes we think about our sin that way. That, hey, hey, I got this going on here and I got this going on over here. All right? And so, so we kind of think like, hey, we're filled up with water over here and we're filled up with water over here. And we got these two, these two separate sections of our life. But then, but then, and we're just going to call these, if I can get the caps off of this thing, all right, we're just going to, let's just call this work, all right? So this is work. And, you know, we're fudging some numbers and we're doing something, so, you know, that's not really good. God's not really pleased with that. We call that sin, all right? So say you are sinning at work. I'm not going to color code it and say you did something wrong. Let's just flat out say you, you did something, you sinned, okay? You sinned at work, Okay? So it's a little tainted. But it's okay because you got your compartment. It won't get out. It won't leak. You see this in Jonah's life, right? It, it's just me. It's only going to affect me. I can, I can just keep it to me. And maybe if I'm lucky, I, I can keep it even in that one area. Like if I do bad things at work and kind of fudge numbers, then it won't really affect, it won't really affect my family life. It's not really going to get there, right? Because I got these little compartments all set up. And it's working out really good for me right now. And so, you know, I, but you know what? Over here, over here is, a, I don't know, what should we call this one? Any suggestions? What should we call this, this area of your life? Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. We're going to call this the effect of the other people. What we're going to call that is uh, the, debil- the, the, the desire to be liked by people, okay? So over here, you kind of have this, uh, this popularity part. Right here, this is the popularity part, all right? All right, but it's okay because, yeah, you're, you're kind of going against what you know is right and what you know to be right and what you, you know to be true. And so you're kind of, kind of doing some things to gain some stature and some exposure um, so that you gain in popularity, okay? But it's okay because if the fish tank is your life, you've got it compartmentalized. You got the sin controlled. You got it in these little compartments. It's not going to leak into the rest of it. We kind of got these little compartments before, right? You see that in Jonah's life? All right. Um, Here is the issue. I just have a question for you. And that is simply this. How'd that work for the Titanic? Right? How'd that work for the Titanic? Because this is not reality. Hard compartments that don't leak into the rest of my life when I sin is not reality. Our lives are much more like this. These are fishnet sides, right? Our lives, every area of our life, everything in our life is much more like this. And it's in our life, and this is how it looks. And instead of staying separate, and instead of saying, um, in our own little nice compartments, all, all separated, and we got all our little sin packaged up in the own little co- corner of our heart. What really happens is that sin infects the entire ship and begins to seep out of these areas of our life in to our other areas of our life. All right? And slowly, sin characterized by blue dye, like slowly, begins to take over more and more of our life. It begins to seep in slowly to the rest of our life because the principle is simply that sin infects the entire ship. You can't keep sin in one little area of your life or just contained to yourself 
it will slowly seep out and begin to color everything else in your life and in my life. And because that is true, I just want to spend the last couple minutes we have this morning talking to you really quickly and, and somewhat, <laughs> somewhat briefly uh, about areas, warning signs of a sinking ship. All right, because this is this is a true reality of what our hearts and what our lives are really like. We got to know from Jonah's life what are the warning signs? What are the practical signs that there's sin in some area of my life that is seeping out into the rest of my life? What are those warning signs? And we find them in Jonah for the rest of the for this chapter. You ready? Warning signs of a sinking ship. You get like the sin king sinking. Anyway, that's a cool thing I thought, but whatever. It's all good. All right. Verse 5. Oh, no. Verse 5. Now verse 5. Um, warning signs of a sinking life or a sinking ship. All the sailors were afraid. Each cried out to their own God. They threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. All right. First sign of a sinking ship. I'm covering up rather than fessing up. All right, I'm covering up rather than fessing up. Jonah gets on this boat, and the first thing he does is he makes a beeline for the hole, for the, for the bottom basement, bottom dwelling, whatever you call that thing on a ship. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go hide in the corner of the bottom of the boat, and I'm going to go to sleep because I don't want anybody to know what I'm doing. I don't want anybody to ask me any questions. I don't want anybody to see that I'm here. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't exist on this ship. And so he, Jonah just goes in his own little cover-up, right? His own little, like, I'm just going to hide. I'm just going to go down here and hide. And essentially what, what he's doing, and I think what sometimes we do when this is true of us, we, we spend all of our time trying to just cover it up. We're, like, we're basically walking backwards with a broom, just kind of sweeping away the tracks, like, cover the tracks, cover the tracks, you know, cover the tracks. If the first thought is, oh no, someone's going to find out, how do I get rid of it? That's a pretty good sign that, that this is an issue. We're spending our time covering things up. We're hiding in dark places so that, so that nobody finds out our sin. If that's true of you somewhere in your life, that phenomenon's bound to happen sooner or later. And is happening right now, you just don't notice it yet. Alright? Number two from verse six. Here, here's what I, I love about this from two. Verse six. Um, fell into a deep sleep, and the captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. And Jonah's like, my God is taking notice of us. Like, that's the problem. Like, I'm not praying. Can you see, Jonah, all those hardened fishermen are down on their knees, weeping like babies, begging their gods to rescue them. And Jonah's asleep because he's like, I ain't praying. Like, there's no way I'm praying because I know what's going to happen if I pray. Right? Number two, I can't bring myself to pray. There, there's a cover-up. There's something going on. There's sin somewhere if you just can't pray about it. Because you know the second you start to pray about it, there's that little twinge of guilt, that little conviction thing you got going on. Like you're like, I'm just not, I, you've been there. I've been there. It's like, I'm just not going to pray about it. Because I know it's gonna, what's going to happen. I know I'm going to be convicted about it. And Jonah's the same way right here. He's like, I'm not praying. Like, I'm going to have to go to Nineveh if I pray. So there is no way that I am praying right now. I can't bring myself to pray about it. I love this one. This one may be... It may be my favorite, but it also may be the least biblical. But anyway, we'll just go there anyway. All right. Number three, signs of a sinking ship. Common questions bring conviction. All right. You've been there, right? You've been there. Actually, don't do that. That's number four. Number three. I'll go to that one in a minute. Number three is odds seem to be stacked against me. All right. The sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. All right, casting lots is how they did it in the Bible. So what they do is it's either dice or straws or somehow they, they just kind of, it's a gamble. They cast lots to see who the lot falls to. Now, can you see Jonah? Like Jonah's there on the ship and there's got to be probably 25, 50, 60 other guys on the ship, right? And Jonah's like, all right, roll that dice, baby. And if I get a six, Pete goes over, not me. You know, like, that's Jonah. He's like, yes, all right? Or he's got this, like, don't draw the short straw. Don't draw the short straw. Don't draw the short straw. Short straw. Darn it. 
Like, that's Jonah's life, right? Have you ever been in a situation where everything goes bad at the same time? Right? And the odds just seem to be against you for some reason. Something's going on. And you're like, God, really? The air conditioner, the furnace, the vacuum cleaner, and the car all at the same time, all breaking down? Right? I don't believe in luck. So when that happens to me, I'm like, why is God trying so desperately to get my attention right now? What is going on? God is trying desperately to make things go wrong in my life so that I get back to what I should be doing. And it doesn't always have to be sin, and that's why I say they're warning signs. They're not, they're not absolutes. But, but what is going on in my life right now that like God is so desperately trying to get my attention and the odds seem to be always against me? I can't get, quote-unquote, lucky. What's going on with that? Now number four. Common questions bring conviction, Right? <laughs> As a teenager, you've done this. You've been here. I'm with you. All right? You walk in late. Mom and dad are sitting on the couch. You were out too late doing something, teeping, egging, riding down Bluff Road, with hanging out the window while shooting a paintball gun, taking out signs. Not that that's from real life, okay? But you know you were out doing something you weren't supposed to be doing. And dad asks you a question. How was your night? Don't. Great, had a good time. And every single question is like a guilt trip, like right at your heart, because you know, and you're playing the game, right? Did they know that I know? Do they, do they know that I know that they know? Do, should I say something? Should I confess now? They don't know. How could they possibly know? There's no way they can know that I did, right? And you're playing that game where common questions just bring conviction, and I see that right here in the text. And they're asking Jonah all these questions. Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? They're not really bad questions. They just want to know what's up with Jonah. And everyone is like a guilt trip for him. And finally, he raises it. Okay, I did it. I'm guilty. It's my fault. I worship God, okay? And that's where they're like, really? You're running from the God of the sea in the sea? That's not too bright, Jonah. All right? Common questions just bring conviction. Signs of a sinking ship. I actually asked my dad one time. I was like, why, why were you asking me all those questions? He's like, I just wanted to take an interest in your life, right? <laughs> He's like, I hadn't, I didn't, he never knew I never confessed, but whatever, don't do what I do. All right? I never confessed, so I was like, next morning, I was like, Dad, why, why are you asking all these questions? You know, and he's like, I just want to be interested in what you're doing and just trying to take an interest in what's going on in your life. He had no motive, but every single one was like, guilty, 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 right here. Common questions bring convictions. And the last one is, is simply this from verse 12. Pick me up, throw me into the sea, Jonah replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. I know I'm wrong, and I just keep going. Warning sign of a sinking ship. I know I'm wrong. And I just keep going. I know this storm is my fault. I know everything about this situation is my fault. I know that I don't want to pray. I don't want to repent. I don't want to do any of that stuff. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know what? I'm just going to keep going. You know what? Just throw me overboard. Just throw me overboard. I know I'm totally guilty and totally wrong, but I'm just going to continue to go down that path. I'm just going to continue to do that. Jonah never once in, this, in the chapter 1, goes, you know what? It's my fault. Let me go over here. I'll pray to my God. We'll see what he wants to do. He may have still ended up overboard, but they may have been able to turn that ship around and take him back to port and get him headed in the right direction. But we'll never know because Jonah's like, I'm just going to keep going. I'm just going to keep going down the path that I'm on. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter how many opportunities to repent God throws at me. I'm just going to continue to do what I know is wrong. And when that happens, just, just take this, write this down if you want, whatever. You're about to meet the whale. If you're there, it's about to get really bad. If you know it's wrong and you just keep doing it, and you keep doing it, and you keep doing it. Worship team, why don't you come on up? <clears throat> um, so the crew tosses Jonah overboard. Jonah's swallowed by a fish or a whale or whatever you want to call it. Okay? And the curtain just kind of closes on chapter one. Jonah's like, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going down this path. I don't care what happens. I'm not going to Nineveh. 
toss them over, chapter's over. Just kind of leaves, kind of leaves you there. We're left kind of wondering, like, what happens next? If we don't read through chapter 2, 3, 4, we don't really know the rest of the story. The curtain just kind of closes on the narrative. It leaves you hanging with some pretty, pretty big questions about Jonah, about what he, I mean, Jonah's the pastor, right? And he's running. He's the prophet, and he's running. And it just kind of leaves you with what happens when we run. What happens when I'm supposed to be the one that knows what the deal is and how to do it all, and I decide that my heart is just not in it? You know, I, I'm going to just end. Like, I'm just going to leave you hanging for a week. I'm just going to leave you hanging because I think those two, God's, will is, God's word is God's will for God's people, and that sin infects the whole ship. Like, I think those two things are enough for you just to think about this week. Kind of just meditate on this week. Because I think my guess is that I, I have struggled through those two things this past week in preparing this. So it's going to be it's going to be a convicting week, I hope, for you. It's my prayer that you go over those two things with yourself, with your spouse, with your kids. Just think through what are the implications of that way of living, of running from God's word and just continuing to go down in sin. Hey, you all got, you all are wondering, what are the whales for? Right? I just just cut these out to give to you because I just want you to take it home, have something in your hand to take home, and just to write on here as as you're in God's word and as you're praying this week and, and as you're kind of meditating and wherever you are in your reading plan or whatever you're doing, what are the things, write them on this whale, write them on the whale. What are the things that are keeping me from living a whale of a tale? A tale worth telling. A story that is drop dead, amazing, awesome for God. What are the things that are keeping me as it pertains to God's word and sin in my life? What are those things that are keeping me from living a whale of a tale? And as God brings them to your heart and your mind, just write them on the whale. Just write them on the whale as just a kind of a reminder of what God is doing in your heart.